Running a business in Philadelphia takes a lot. It takes strong relationships, unique insight, and inspired leadership. It takes staying in the know and making the most of every opportunity. Everything it takes is everything you'll find at CCPA. A resource for business support, a chance to hear from experts in their field and get up close and personal with city leaders. An insider's guide to what's happening and what's next in Philadelphia. With CCPA, business is personal. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you all here today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Suzette Munley of Munley Associates and the president of CCPA. I hope everyone is doing well and enjoying the warm weather. And I know we're all looking forward to returning to activities in Center City. CCPA is an intimate and diverse group of business owners, executives, and managers looking to build relationships and offer each other meaningful resources. We take pride in bringing you unparalleled access to speakers, decision makers, and leaders who are shaping Center City. We keep our members and guests informed about business challenges and opportunities in Philadelphia. So let's take a minute and touch on the benefits of becoming a member, a sponsor, or collaborating with CCPA. We think it's easiest to remember as being Center City Smart. We have signature events where you get the inside scoop on development, sustainability, exceptional women leaders, and the city's movers and shakers. There are marketing opportunities available only to members and sponsors, which enable you to reach thousands of businesses and consumers. You'll have access to our speakers and panelists in a way few organizations can deliver. The up close, intimate, and personal experience of a CCPA event is like no other. You can reimagine your employee benefits available to members through Penworth Financial Services, and you can take the lead with opportunities to build your network, grow your business, and be a CCPA ambassador. So if you'd like to join today, there's a link posted in the chat. And now to mark your calendars for our upcoming events, they are posted on your screen. So please take note of those and a special call out to our next Central City Leaders with Jeff Gorenstein, Executive Director of the Economy League of Greater Philadelphia. For today's event, we encourage you to use the chat to ask questions or comment and to connect with each other. And you can find a link there to today's program. I'd like to acknowledge CCPA's sustaining sponsor and our preferred benefits provider, Michael Craig of Penworth Financial Services. The Lunch with City Leaders is made possible by Citizens Bank and our sponsors, Arsenal Media Works, Community College of Philadelphia, Friedman LLP, KYW News Radio, Love Lane, Post Brothers, and Visit Philadelphia. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Post Brothers CEO. Michael Pestrong to say a few words and introduce our speaker. Thank you, Suzette. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My brother Matt and I founded Post Brothers in 2006 to develop and operate best in class apartment buildings uh, throughout the Mid Atlantic and, and Northeast. And today, uh, Post Brothers is among the most active multifamily developers in the Northeast. And we, we love being based in Philadelphia and, and growing our company here. Uh, we were previously uh, CCPA lunch featured guest speakers, and, uh, and we're proud to support this event series and CCPA's mission. And it's my honor to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Manu Astana oversees the largest power grid in North America and the largest electricity market in the world, PJM. He has extensive leadership experience across the electric industry, including power generation operations, optimization and dispatch, competitive retail and electricity, electricity and natural gas trading, and risk management, uh, which he acquired across more than 21 years in the industry. And from, from my perspective, he has one of the most interesting and important jobs um, in the country. He transitioned into what is effectively civil service to run the electric grid for the Mid-Atlantic region. And for those that don't know, there are nine electric grids uh, in the US and PJM, which he runs, has the reputation of being uh, the best managed grid, um, being the best in terms of transparency and liquidity for market participants. and as uh, carbon burning electric generation shifts to renewables over the next 30 years, which is an unquestionable trend that's happening. And as 
uh, things that today burn carbon at their sources, like transportation and building heat, uh, shift to being powered by electricity from the grid, from the grid over that same time period. Uh, he has a lot of work to do. So his full bio is in the program uh, posted in the chat. And please join me in a warm welcome for Mundo Astana. Thank you very much, Michael. Just confirming you can hear me all right? Excellent. Yes, we can. Yes. Well, good. Uh, looking at my watch here. Good afternoon, everyone. It is great to be here with you today. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak. Uh, it really is an honor. Um, and I connected with Michael a little bit before this uh, before this call, just to, just to have a conversation. And I was really blown away by how much he knows about our markets and about what you know we are up to. So hopefully. Um, Others do as well, but what I thought I would do is I would talk to you about a few things. Start just with a bit of an introduction to myself. Um, talk about my organization, PJM, what it is we do, what our mission is, and a little bit of what sort of brought me here. Uh, and then reflect on uh, the core of our mission, which not to leave you hanging, is really reliability of the bulk electric system across um, a pretty large swath of the country. So we serve about one in five Americans, about 65 million people or 20% of the nation's population, 20% roughly of the electricity needs of the country. And I'll talk about where we fit in to the whole thing. You're familiar with Pico, who is a local distribution company, um, a key partner of ours. And I'll talk about what it is we do and reliability and then some reflections on recent events in Texas. And uh, um, I'm sure you, you, you watched over President's Day as uh, uh, there were pretty widespread power outages in Texas. And then the implications of that for us, I actually got invited to speak to the, uh, the US Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee shortly after the Texas events. Uh, and the question on people's minds, on, on the senators' minds really was, you know, can this happen here? And what should we be doing to prevent it from happening here? And so I'll, I'll just reflect on a little bit of what I told them. Um, and then hopefully that'll take me about 20 uh, plus or minus minutes. And then I'd really like to have a conversation with you. Uh, I don't want to sort of drone on and on. Uh, I'd love to get to the questions that are on all of your minds. So hopefully that works for everyone. So just starting with a an introduction to myself. This is my second time living in Philadelphia. The first time living in Philadelphia was when I was, I just turned 17 and I uh, was, uh, I came here as an international student. I went to Penn uh, undergrad um, and you can imagine the experience. It was 1991, um, West Philadelphia was, um, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure you'll agree, different back then. I, I've been to Penn's campus recently and it's, it's really not recognizable, it's, it's gorgeous. And uh, back, in, uh, back in 91, when I got here at the age of 17, 10,000 miles away from you know, my folks, um, it was quite different, it was a different experience. Um, but I really enjoyed my time at Penn. Um, uh, I, I studied finance, ended up working for a bank in Chicago and learn how to trade U.S. Treasury bond options, of all things. Uh, and I, I like to tell people that um, the bond option market was extremely efficient. There were no opportunities. I looked around and found opportunities in the energy industry. But, you know, if I tell the truth, uh, what happened was I, I met a girl uh, and she was living in Houston uh, at the time. And so uh, I was determined to spend time with her. Uh, ended up looking for a job in Houston and found a job in the energy industry. And that's how I made my transition into energy and into, into Texas. I uh, lived in Texas for over 20 years uh, and did a, a host of roles that were very commercial roles. So I, was, I was running trading businesses. I was chief risk officer for a Fortune 500 company in the energy space. Um, I ran a, uh, the largest competitive electric and gas retailer in the country uh, and one of the largest home services companies, actually, um, all at the same time. And so we had a, um, a, a gas retailer, uh, an electric retailer, and a home services company. And really, we were trying to uh, combine all of those services for the benefits of customers. 
And so I spent 10 years at one company, uh, mostly in Dallas, 10 years in one company, mostly in Houston, um, ended up getting married to the, the girl that, I, that drew me to Texas. And we've been married for 23 years this month. Um, there are two kids. Um, but I got to the point in my career uh, where you know, I, I did what I came there to do at both the companies, trans, transformed the companies um, from where they were when I started to exactly where I wanted to get them to. And it was time for the next challenge. And I took a little bit of time off and thought about what I wanted to do. And I, I, I saw this job at PJM. The, when the, the recruiter called me, my first reaction was, you know, there's no way I would even consider doing that job because, uh, you know, when, when everything goes well, nobody knows your name, which is fine. But when things don't go well, uh, then everybody knows your name, which is perhaps less fine uh, under those circumstances. And I went from that perspective to the perspective of, uh, be, becoming interested and then trying to get the role and then actually getting the role and transitioning into the role. And what, what changed my mind about it was the ability to make a difference. I was really, um, after the career that I'd had, I was in a place where I wanted to do something that had an impact beyond just the organization that I worked in. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, I really enjoyed leading the organizations that I led having an impact, hopefully a positive impact on the lives of the people that work there and the lives of our customers. But I wanted to have a broader societal impact. And PGM was located right at the intersection of the energy transition that's happening today. And I'll talk a little bit about what PGM does. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the energy transition that's happening. Um, and hopefully that gives you a little bit of context for um, what drew me here. So PJM is a, uh, is a grid operator. So we operate the high voltage part of the electric grid. And you can think about that as the, you know, the highway system, um, right? Where there's, a, uh, there's cars that are traveling on the highway system and then they get off the highway system and they're traveling on local roads and then they finally get to their home. Well, we manage the equivalent of the highway system. And then uh, we hand it off, we hand the electricity off to local distribution companies like Pico, who then take it on the lower voltage part of the grid all the way to your homes or your businesses. Um, we are a, um, and we don't own, it's important to say, we don't own the generation assets. We don't own the transmission assets. So to give an, another analogy, we're a little bit like the air traffic control system. We're actually controlling the flow of the electricity. We're controlling the dispatch um, of the generators, but we're not actually investing directly in, in those. And so we operate, we're not organized as a nonprofit, but we operate as a, uh, a nonprofit. So in January of 2020, I started my first job ever where I didn't have a profit target, which has been really interesting for me. But uh, PJM is, um, I think, as Michael said, the largest grid operator in the country. Uh, I think you might have said the best grid operator, which I also agree with. We're also the largest grid operator in the country, located here in, we're headquartered here in, um, in Valley Forge. Uh, we have uh, our office, our control room, and then we've got a separate control room elsewhere in Pennsylvania that is completely redundant. We serve 13 states um, and the District of Columbia, and we are lucky enough to serve a really diverse set of states. So if you think about from an energy policy perspective, New Jersey, um, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, North Carolina, but also Tennessee, Kentucky, um, and, um, and several others. So really a broad swath. Um, and like I said, 65 million people um, who we serve. We have about 1,000 people, employees and contractors. And we have three core functions. So we plan the transmission system, looking at all the way out to 15 years, but the bulk of the planning is happening five years out. We um, operate markets. So we believe in competitive markets wherever possible, trying to deliver ultimately reliability, but at the least possible cost. And we have real-time operations, like I mentioned, our two control rooms that are that are pretty neat. There are YouTube videos out there that you can look at if you want to get a, a glimpse into our control rooms. I encourage you to, to look at it if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, very, very um, exciting operations. Our purpose 
uh, and our organization's driving purpose since it was founded in uh, 1927. In fact, we were founded, I think, in the basement of, of one of Pico's facilities and now have grown into this organization has been reliability uh, of the bulk electric system and reliability at the least possible cost. Um, and, and our markets have broadly delivered that. So if you think about reliability of the bulk electric system, it has been tremendous. And I'll talk about the example of Texas and the example of the February storms that we just went through. Um, but you know, we were very well positioned. We, um, we ended up being completely reliable on the bulk electric system and exporting record amounts of electricity um, to, um, to our neighbors, both New York as well as the Midwest. Uh, which was a source of great pride for us. But, um, you know, in, in previous events where we've had difficulties, they have supported us, which is also a part of the benefit of being interconnected. But I talked about reliability at the least cost. And I think the cost part of the equation uh, as owners and operators of businesses is critical to you. It's critical to consumers at home. Um, and I recently had an annual meeting with our members and talked about the economic recovery. And it's a, it's a very interesting phenomenon that we're seeing this K-shaped recovery that people talk about, where uh, if you look at the stock market, you know, things are great. I mean, they're going extremely well. And if you look at many of us who uh, have just sort of moved our operations to our homes or uh, you know, to hybrid office and home uh, setups, things are, things are fine, things are good. But there's a lot of people for whom things are not good that, that are really struggling um, at the moment. And so this cost aspect of our mission is really important, is really important to us. And I'm very happy to say that in 2020, uh, the, the last full year that we have, uh, our markets delivered the, the lowest total wholesale electric costs in the history of our markets. So reliability at least cost. Um, let me just talk a little bit more about reliability. I, I took over this job on January 1st, 2020. Uh, and um, the first week on the job, I had a conversation with my security team and they said, hey, there's this, there's this virus. Uh, and it was in the context of we were having visitors from the Singapore grid operator. And they brought me this map and they said, there's, here's a picture of Wuhan and here's where Singapore is. And are we sure that we want to open our campus at the moment to international visitors? And this was before, you know, this was in the first week of January. And we, we ended up taking a very conservative position just because of what we do um, and closed our, grid, our, uh, our offices and our control rooms off to any visitors that were, um, that were not from within the US. And then soon we closed them off to all visitors, even for people who work at PJM. We ended up uh, sequestering our operators. We built a third control room that had a separate air supply to keep our people safe. But when I say sequestering, we ended up getting campers and had people living on our campus for up to 10 weeks at a time so that we had a reserve of operators that was available in case we had a lot of people get sick just so that we could keep operating the grid. We were talking to the grid operators in China uh, and in Italy, which were till then some of the worst hit places on the planet, just to understand what precautions they had taken and try to learn from them. Um, so reliability is such a core aspect of what we do. It's, it's interwoven into, uh, into everything we do. So just given, my, given that and given my background living in Texas for so long, I, uh, I sort of randomly woke up in the morning of uh, the 14th of February. And normally I wake up in the morning and you know, in the middle of the night and I go back to sleep. But for some reason, I picked up my phone and opened up the app. And I looked at the Texas Grid Operator app, which was a really bizarre thing for me to do in the middle of the night. And, I, and I, then I didn't sleep for, uh, for several days because they were in the middle of this terrible, terrible situation. And what happened there was, the, you know, as you know, there was this, this incredible cold front that came and sat in the middle part of our country, making it roughly 28 degrees colder than normal. 
In Dallas, it was two degrees below zero, which is uh, is almost unheard of. I mean, it is cold as it had been for 72 years. And the power plants down there were not weatherized for the cold, and neither was the gas, um, the production system, or the processing system. And um, they started losing generators because it was so cold. And then they started to, uh, they were forced to order the, the, the shedding of firm load to keep the grid in balance. And um, as they did that, unfortunately, they weren't coordinated with their gas production system, which was one of the main sources of fuel at the time. And so they started shutting off electricity to the gas um, production system and the processing system, which just put them in this spiral of um, then they had less gas, then they had to shed more um, load, and, uh, and then they had less gas, and then they had to shed more load, and got to the point where there were at 1.4 million people uh, who didn't have electricity. And it was for several days. Uh, and the, and the, the plan was for rotating outages. So you'd have your power cut for an hour, and then it'd come back, and then it would just keep cycling. But because things got so bad, at one point, they had lost almost 50% of their generation that they weren't able to rotate the outages anymore, which is really what caused a lot of the physical damage. Um, and as I watched that, uh, and as I thought about what the implications were for us, I really had two or three big thoughts that I wanted to share. I mean, the first one is, is just for us, and for me, it was a, a sobering reminder of the purpose behind what it is that our organization does. Uh, you know, there are lives at stake. There is economic, significant economic activity at stake. And it's very clear that modern society has zero tolerance for extended outages or shortages of electric supply. And so, you know, on one hand, it's very daunting uh, because, um, you, you have to operate uh, perfectly all the time, always, right? <laughs> which, is, which, is a, which is a difficult thing to do. And then you layer the pandemic on top of that and, uh, and it gets really interesting and challenging. But on the other hand, I, I found it really motivating because um, to me, it's just a reinforcement of what our organization does makes a difference. It makes a real difference um, and, and it has an impact. And that's, that's why I came here. So the first thing was really the, the, the purpose behind the organization uh, and the validation of the importance of that. The second reflection that I had was that um, the question that I was asked by the Senate, uh, well, one of the questions, which was, look, can this happen here? And the answer to that question is, um, it could happen here. There's no way to 100% guarantee that something like that wouldn't happen in any grid in the world. However, we are actually really well situated and it is much less likely to happen here. And it's less likely to happen here for a few reasons. One, Texas was and is an electrical island where uh, our region is connected um, all the way up and down um, the eastern part, the eastern half of the country, really east of the Rockies. Um, all the way up into Canada as one synchronous grid. And that gives incredible diversity and the ability for different parts of the grid to support each other. Uh, PJM has um, very ample reserves. We've got a lot of fuel diversity. We've got um, uh, a lot of discipline from our generator community around winterization and um, hardening of their systems and strong operations. And we see that in the availability metrics around those generators, even during extreme events. So um, there is a, a lot of uh, a reason for uh, uh, positivity and feeling confident that we're well situated and our grid is robust. Uh, but the third point that I reflected on and that I, that I mentioned to the Senate, and I'll tell you as well, there is more we can do. There is always more that we can do. In this role, we, this, there's no... Uh, resting on the past. And some of the things that we're looking at, one of them is making sure that our distribution companies are coordinated with our gas producing assets. So if we ever had to order 
load shed that we wouldn't cut critical load the way that uh, that uh, ended up happening in Texas. Uh, we're looking at what the right pricing schemes are to make sure that we don't get into the extremely high sustained pricing that they got into in Texas. That was so destabilizing to a lot of their uh, generators, as well as to, to several of their load serving entities. Um, and in general, we're looking at, do we need even more winterization as well as hardening standards for increasingly extreme weather scenarios? I mean, we are seeing, um, we forecast the weather for the purposes of forecasting electric load, and we're seeing uh, warming trends and we're incorporating those warming trends, but we're also seeing trends that are increasing wind weather events. If you look at uh, insurance claims across the country, uh, insurance claims over the last 20 years have been going up meaningfully as a result of more extreme events that are happening. Uh, and so we're constantly asking ourselves, what of those events should we plan for? Uh, because obviously if you plan for every single thing, uh, we don't have, uh, we don't have infinite amounts of money to spend, and we have to be cognizant that we're spending the money of, of people who, um, you know, who need it uh, for just to live, as well as businesses who need to be competitive from their energy cost. Uh, but on the other hand, we, we know that we can't accept extended outages of, of electric supply. So you know, what degree of extreme weather and other extreme events do we plan for? And if you think about the way that we operate the grid, we are constantly so every minute we're simulating um, every component of the grid failing. And if any component fails, what happens to the, redis the automatically redispatch flow of electricity? And if post that failure and post that redispatch flow, the grid is still secure or if it's not secure. So imagine on top of that layering on additional extreme scenarios. Uh, it's a really interesting, really challenging, really complex problem, but again, a worthwhile problem. Um, the other thing I just wanted to reflect on with you, and then I'll stop, and hopefully we can have a conversation, is the energy transition itself that brought me to PJM. Um, the, the grid is really undergoing a transformation, and it's driven by, uh, by you. It's driven by customer preferences, first and foremost. Uh, it's driven by changes in policy, but often those policy changes reflect customer and voter uh, preferences. Um, and those policies are driven by states and they're driven by the federal government. And it's driven by changes in technology. So renewable generation, solar, batteries, wind have become significantly more efficient and they've become significantly cheaper. And so they're starting to penetrate the grid. Um, and if you think about where PJM is, we're mostly on the Eastern seaboard, um, and the northeastern part of the country, we're not particularly well endowed with wind or solar, unless you're counting offshore wind. Um, the, the real wind blows across the plains. So you look at sort of the middle part of the country all the way down to Texas, and the solar part of the country is the bottom third, the smile of the country. And so where we're at, we are a little behind where other parts of the country are in renewable penetration. We are uh, less than 10% renewable at the moment. And if you look at places like the Southwest Power Pool, which is north of Texas, they have reported um, just this, this month, this last month in April, over an 80% instantaneous renewable penetration, meaning at, at an instant, 80% of the electricity was coming from renewable generation. And so this transition is happening. Uh, we have several places we can look to, to look at different models of the way that it might progress. Um, and it's happening in PGM. So we have a very large interconnection queue, our interconnection queue, which is the generators that are waiting to connect with us or trying to study connecting with us are greater in terms of nameplate capacity than the total load in the system. And 92% of them are either wind solar, battery, or a hybrid of those. So this transition is, is absolutely happening right now. And um, there are many aspects of what we do that will hopefully facilitate this transition uh, 
And there are many ways we could take that, right? And the, the, we've spent a lot of time thinking about what is our role in this transition. And, and really our role as PJM is to ensure that this transition happens reliably first and foremost, and then happens cost effectively and efficiently using scale regional markets and scale regional planning. And we're working very closely with um, state governments. So we've got a, um, a close partnership, for instance, with New Jersey, who's looking to implement large amounts of offshore wind, as is Maryland, as is Virginia. Um, um, and then we're working closely with all of our states on really facilitating their decarbonization policies or other energy policies uh, to get to the grid of the future in a reliable and efficient way. So it's a really exciting time at PGM. There is a lot going on, a lot of consequence going on. Uh, and I'm really glad to be here. And I'm really glad to be here in Philadelphia. So with that, let me stop. Thank you for your attention and for letting me tell my story and my organization's story and love to take your questions and have a conversation. Terrific, thank you. So I have a couple questions that have come in to me, um, but if anybody has any questions, you can post them in the chat or uh, raise your hand. We can always unmute and um, ask the question. So I'll just start. Um, how are lowest prices decided uh, for distribution to homes and businesses? Is that on your end or suppliers? Yeah, so <clears throat> what happens is there is a wholesale price and the wholesale price is determined through uh, our markets for the most part. Uh, it's, it's, there's a capacity price, which is um, a price just for having generation available to dispatch. There's an energy price, uh, which we uh, are rerunning an auction every five minutes, and it's constrained for the transmission network that we operate. And so we actually generate a separate price for every, um, every node on our system. And we're trying to calculate what's called a locational marginal price. Uh, and then there's, uh, there's the cost of transmission itself. Um, and a lot of that is planned by us. Some of it is planned by the transmission operators. And then further to get it to your home, uh, companies like Pico have their distribution system and they work on um, you know, the cost of main maintaining and building out that distribution system and they add it on to the wholesale cost um, and they transfer it uh, and, and they charge that uh, to us at home or for our businesses. So a, part, uh, a good part of that is determined by us, but then there's a distribution part of that that is not. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about the differences between regulated and deregulated state programs? Yeah, some of our states are um, what are called vertically integrated states. So um, Virginia uh, is an example of that where Dominion Energy is one of the larger, is the largest um, energy company or electricity company in Virginia. And they own their generation, they own the transmission, they own the distribution, and they are um, vertically integrated and they're regulated. So their retail rates are regulated by their, uh, by their state public utility commission and their um, wholesale rates are regulated by the federal energy regulatory commission. Um, and um, so that's sort of one business model. The other part of the business model is a deregulated business model. Uh, and you can see that in Pennsylvania, for example, where you can select your supplier uh, and that supplier separately accesses the wholesale market to try to get the best rates for you uh, and then adds on the distribution cost from the local distribution company. So that's another, um, another uh, business model. And so in some instances, you have to get your supply from the single regulated provider and, and the public utility commission regulates them to make sure that you're getting a good rate. And on other hands, uh, on, on the other hand, you've got this deregulated choice where the customer is really on the hook to make sure they're getting the best rate. And we have both of those models within PGM. Our markets serve both types of business models. Okay. Uh, Carol? Yeah. Um, so I know that you mentioned you've testified in front of the Senate. Um, and just thinking about the proposed infrastructure bill and whether this covers, whether there's discussion about that covering kind of some of the issues that you've addressed and whether PGM would benefit from that and like where, if so, 
where would we want to, or where would you likely see, we would likely see some of those initial investments happening? Yeah. So uh, the most recent State of the Union, I am told, was the first time that a president has ever mentioned the word uh, transmission in the State of the Union, which I find personally exciting. Um, but the, the, the thought behind it is that, um, I mean, President Biden has come out and said that his goal is to get to uh, net zero emissions from the electric grid by 2035, which is a very, very ambitious and aggressive agenda, but that's his agenda. And to do it, one of the, the components, uh, necessary components, is the construction of transmission, particularly interstate transmission to get electricity, renewable electricity from places where there is ample wind and solar to places where there's load. Um, and, uh, and so there's a big national push to invest in that transmission. Uh, obviously investment dollars are only one component of what it takes to get that to happen. Um, siting, local siting is, is critical. And obviously nobody, not nobody, but people are very resistant to having uh, transmission lines near their land. Um, so I think that that ends up being a pretty big issue as well. Um, but I think it's an important push. This infrastructure push is to for the country to meet the stated decarbonization goals nationally, or even to come close, there is going to need to be a transmission build out that is meaningful. At the same time, I don't think every single transmission line needs to get built. Uh, I think there's a um, you know, there's, you can think of this matrix, which on one axis has potential generation investments and on the other axis has potential transmission investments to support that generation scenario. Uh, and inside that matrix, there is a roughly an efficient frontier and we need to seek that efficient frontier. And what's interesting is within sort of our region, we have established processes to do that, but part of the solution that is gonna be needed is inter-regional transmission. And we do have inter-regional processes as well, uh, but they, um, they generally result in less transmission investment than I think is needed. And so I think there needs to be a shift uh, nationally in how we think about evaluating whether certain transmission lines are on that efficient frontier and then um, incending them to get built. Um, you had mentioned uh, hearing, uh, I guess, customer demand or hearing from customers, you know, what they need. How do you engage? In other words, a lot of people probably haven't heard of um, PJM. They only at least hear no PICO. Um, are you hearing customers' needs through the suppliers, through you? How does that, how does that work? Yeah, so we have a pretty robust stakeholder process, and we have um, five different formal sectors, all of whom vote um, on um, the future of various initiatives within PGM. And the sectors are transmission owners, generation owners, end use customers, uh, electric distributors, and then sort of everyone else, including trading companies and the like. And so we hear through that stakeholder process, we will have actually industrial customers that show up as part of the end user group and um, speak to us. We'll hear, we have a group called Consumer Advocates of the PJM States that represents consumers that'll show up and speak to us. Uh, but from my perspective there, we, we can't have enough input from consumers who are ultimately paying for everything, um, including paying for our organization. Um, and so um, really happy to get direct feedback as well from other customers, including folks that are on this call. Uh, if you've got perspectives, I'd love to hear them either just now or, you know, separately, give me a call. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah. So the one I mentioned this briefly to you before, as a, as a potential um, uh, power producer, the, the, there was an issue with, you know, if you want to create new um, power production today, especially renewables or anything you want to do, I think, but uh, renewables are what we've looked at. There's the bottleneck is is the is the interconnection process and um, not necessarily knowing 
as a sponsor or developer of a power plant, not necessarily knowing how much it's really going to cost you and how long it's going to take to interconnect. So um, that that being kind of an acknowledged bottleneck today, what um, what what are you doing to um, accelerate accelerate that to be able to you know, meet the renewable goals? Yeah, great question, Michael. Um, the interconnection process is a bottleneck at the moment. We have uh, we have seen volumes of generators trying to connect with us triple in the last few years, and the type of generators and where they're connecting has completely changed. So what it used to be was large combined cycle power generators wanting to connect to the high voltage part of the grid, and it is relatively straightforward to get them connected. Now what we're seeing is much, much smaller generators, often renewable generators that are trying to connect on the low voltage part of the grid, which was never designed for the interconnection. And so it raises a question of really two questions. One, what upgrades need to happen to the network to make sure that the network is still reliable and stable and secure after the interconnection? And the second question is who pays for it? I mean, those are, that's what the interconnection process is trying to figure out. The engineering question, is the easier question to answer. The who pays for it question is in, in a lot of ways really slowing down the process because they're nationally a, several different models, but you can think of them on two extremes. On one extreme, there is the Texas model, which is load pays for interconnection, load pays for all transmission. So generators show up, they get connected, and that cost directly goes to load. And then there's our model, which is, and also by the way, in Texas, they don't really do the network upgrades immediately needed to get that generation to load. So what happens is they get connected quickly, but now your electricity is stuck in West Texas and can't get to load. <laughs> so, right. But right. you're connected quickly, right? Which is, which is good. And I'm not saying that's a bad model. It's just a different model. Our model is it takes longer because we want to make sure that when you connect, we can deliver your energy to load, but then there's more upgrades required. And our model is that the generator pays for that interconnection so that the generator has an incentive to locate at a place that's most efficient. The problem with that is um, it's, like, it's like trying to juggle jello uh, in some ways because the generators are constantly, as you're developing a project, they're changing their technology, they're changing the size of the project. And every time someone changes something in the queue, you have to restudy the whole queue because we're trying to ascribe required upgrades to who caused them. Um, and that is an untenable way, I think, to, uh, to allocate the cost, given the nature of the generators that are trying to interconnect. And so we're having this discussion with our stakeholders now to say, here are the trade-offs. There, there are two different models. One is not better than the other, but, uh, but you do get to different places and at different speeds. And yep. we need to decide which model or which hybrid of which model we want to adopt. And we're sort of knee deep in those conversations right now. And how much of that is up to you versus how much is regulated by the states? Well, all of the interconnection to the bulk power system is really <clears throat> comes through our interconnection process. And so it's regulated by the, it's ultimately regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission who regulates us. So we're a regulated federal um, utility. Um, uh, but the states obviously are very interested in, in this because they have their own renewable programs and they they want to get them interconnected, right? So we're hearing from our states to say, hey, can you speed it up? And we're having the same discussion. Yes, we can, but there are trade-offs to be made. If we're willing to directly allocate the cost to load, then it'll be much quicker because you don't have to constantly recalculate the cost allocations. Um, yep. But then that means that you remove the incentive for efficient siting and load has to take that risk. And yep. so you know, there are trade-offs. Um, and, and unfortunately, there's no perfect answer, but there's a clear recognition that the process does need to evolve. Interesting. How how much um, you know? Given there's on the one hand there's the shift to renewables, but on the other hand there's the coming electrification of you know industry and, and cars and building heat. How much does the grid capacity need to increase in total over the next you know twenty or thirty years as that electrification takes place? That's a great question, and I don't have a great answer for you. We're we're studying that question right now. Some of that is. Um, will depend on how sort of smart we are societally about it. So for instance, if you're charging your electric vehicle at night, 
Um, you know, the grid is typically built out for peak load. The generation, transmission, distribution is built out to be able to serve that peak moment. And so at night, load is not at its peak. So if you're increasing your load uh, and we're smart about how we configure the system, you might be able to do that for almost no incremental infrastructure cost. Uh, but I think that if we want to really decarbonize the economy, um, electrification is a, is a key part of that, whether it's the transportation sector or other sectors. And so you do get to a point where um, the electricity usage increases. And on the other side, you get to a point where you get more intermittent renewable generation. Um, and you know, so there's several problems to solve, one of which is how, what is that peak going to be, which we're working on. But the other problem is what do you do with the excess renewable generation when the load isn't there? And there's, you know, obviously batteries are critical. Uh, we have one of the world's largest pumped hydro storage facilities within our network. Um, and then, you know, people are looking at more advanced futuristic solutions like hydrogen, green hydrogen, you know, effectively using electricity to create hydrogen um, through electricity and then, you know, and then burn that later. Makes sense. Makes sense. And so you talk about the approach of the interconnections of, of ERCOT, for Texas versus here. And so in the, when they had the storms a few months ago, renewables got a lot of blame. Um, do you think it, is it, do you think re renewables inherently made their grid less reliable or was it their kind of the, their process of, of how they approach their interconnections or what, what, what happened? What, what, what was, who's to blame? Well, ultimately what happened was that they had a 48.6% of their generation golf line. Now, part of that was renewables. Um, and so renewables are certainly partly to blame. But it was a pretty small part of that because in the winter, they weren't counting on that much renewables to show up in the first place. And really what is a problem for a grid operator is, um, is unexpected events. If you expect it, you plan for it, and then it's not a problem. Um, so the, the single biggest contributor was... Um, gas fire generation. And part of that was because the plants weren't winterized uh, to that level of cold because people weren't expecting that level of cold. And part of it was because of this phenomenon I talked about where the gas system wasn't winterized and then the coordination between the electric and gas grids worsened things. So that was probably the single biggest contributor. Um, coal piles froze. Um, they had a nuclear unit trip offline, which was a relatively Small part of it, but they did. And then they had, you know, wind turbines ice, um, which, which was also part of it. But I'd say renewables from the data that I've seen were certainly part of it, but a, a minority part of it. Got it. I heard it was they didn't have ice scrapers and squeegees to squeegee off the solar panels, all the snow, but I guess that's not right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think they, they blow it off with, uh, with air. But yeah, uh, that, that, I'm sure that was part of it too. So we had a... We had a question about um, how you increase protection against cyber attacks to the electric grid in the Northeast. Great question, particularly given what's happened to the Colonial Pipeline, uh, but also the Solar Winds hack earlier um, earlier this year. Um, cyber is something that is um, top of mind for us constantly, and we have a very robust cyber program that we coordinate with. Um, the federal government, several of the federal agencies that you would expect us to, as well as the industry. So we don't really talk a lot about our cyber protections because we don't want to advertise them, but suffice it to say, we take it extremely seriously. And um, you know, the cyber threats continue to, to remain elevated uh, for infrastructure in general. Um, so it's something, and you, know, you just look at the Colonial Pipeline, one pipeline, uh, from Houston to New York Harbor, carrying 45% of the gasoline that's used on the East Coast. Um, and that's, that's one pipeline. So um, uh, it, it's critical nationally for us to stay focused on, on cyber. It's a great question and, and constantly on our minds. Um, does PJM have any role in supporting city and state programs that encourage sustainable activities? Uh, for example, in government buildings or in building construction? <clears throat> we don't get down to that level of, because those are typically connected to the distribution grid. And so we don't get involved at that level typically. 
but state programs is pretty broad. And so um, you know, many of our states have um, clean energy mandates or targets, and we are involved with them to help facilitate the achievement of those targets. And the example I gave around New Jersey is a more recent one, and it's one that we're very proud of that partnership. Um, so we do work with our states quite closely, but not down to that level of what's happening inside a particular government facility, unless the facility is, you know, is connected to the, the wholesale grid, and some are, some military facilities are. I just have one last one that came in to me. Um, what are the, or where are the efficient models that our grid would look to internationally to diversify the renewable goals on the Northeast? I don't think there's one model. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot to learn internationally. Um, if you look at, but different countries have made different trade-offs. After the Fukushima nuclear accident, Germany, for instance, decided they didn't want nuclear generation. And so they made a big bet on solar and they have executed on that bet. But what's happened is that their electric rates at the residential level have gone up a lot. I mean, a lot, a lot. And, but that's a trade-off that they have made. And there's no right or wrong trade-off. That's just their trade-off. I think those types of rates would be unacceptable for our consumers. And so you know, there's a lot to learn from them, but also partly that you know, we need to keep a very close eye on the cost of this. Um, but if you look at offshore wind, for example, uh, Europe is absolutely leading in installing offshore wind, and there's a ton to learn from them. And in fact, there are a lot of European companies here in the U.S. on the East Coast working on the installation of offshore wind for that reason. Uh, so we do watch all of those markets. We watch Australia, um, and we watch other markets within the U.S. So California, for example, is a leader in solar, and there's a lot of lessons they've learned, including um, you don't have to care about peak load so much anymore on a gross basis. You care about net peak load. So California is having or has had some reliability issues later in the evening. In the past, it would have been you know, 4 p.m. when it was uh, really hot would be the, the point of peak stress. Well, if you add solar to the mix and significant amounts of solar, then your net peak shifts to later in the day when um, load is still high because your AC is still running but the sun has set. And so, you know, thinking about what that future looks like, we're looking at California and talking to them and learning from them. There's a, there's a lot that they have to, that they can help us with and they're very kind to do so. Um, um, Texas has, great, has a great wind penetration. Uh, we're talking to them in SPP. So we're looking and trying to learn internationally and within the US and there's a lot to learn. Um, can you address how companies and businesses can use PJM incentive programs, both demand response and energy efficiency? Yeah, so we have um, what's called a capacity market, as I mentioned, which is a way for us to ensure ahead of time, three years ahead of time, normally, that there's enough generation to serve the projected peak load when you get there. Because if you don't ensure it ahead of time, you can't build a power plant in a month. You need some lead time to build it. We allow uh, energy efficiency and demand response to participate in those programs. And so, um, and we have a few people that have formed their own company to participate in those programs, but a lot of people work, work with uh, PJM members who are experts in this and can help customers uh, figure out what automation, what controls they need to install to make sure that they are able to interrupt the load when we need it. Um, and they can do so in a way that doesn't cause damage to their industrial process. Um, so it's a great opportunity in general. And I think it's one that while the specific rules may evolve some, imagine a world where we're coming from a world where we had load that was sort of moving around and we were dispatching generation to match it. And we're gonna move into a world where we have load that is moving around more rapidly because now that it has generation behind the meter, distributed generation, whether it's solar or batteries or whatever. And we have generation that's also moving around, solar, wind, in, in sort of sometimes unpredictable ways. And we are dispatching the system to try to keep both of those moving things in balance. Um, and so one of the tools that 
is, I'm convinced is going to be really important to do so is load flexibility. Uh, and so I'd love to see our um, efficiency and demand response programs, but particularly demand response, you know, become uh, or continue to be a big part of the, the solution to reliability into the future. I think they're, they're great programs. They allow for a revenue source for businesses, but then they allow for a reliability source for us. Okay. Any final questions? That's all I have that's come into the chat. I have one more. You mentioned the okay. infrastructure bill, the um, interstate, you know, interstate or interregional connections between between the grid being, you know, a very important component. Given that most of the regular, a lot of the regulations are at state level, who's going to get to own those big transmission lines between the regions? Well, typically it's the it's the transmission company that owns them. So we have a few different ways transmission gets built in PGM. It's either by the incumbent transmission owner, um, so Pico or its parent company, for example, um, or it's by competitive transmission companies, um, or it's by um, <clears throat> a competitive transmission company that kind of actually builds a merchant facility. But in the first two instances, um, the company that builds it owns it. Um, um, you know, in other places, the federal government has built federal power administrations for, um, for this purpose as well in the past. When you look at the Tennessee Valley Authority, for example, or the Western Area Power Administration, that's been a model that the federal government has, been, has used as well, um, in which instance the government would own it. Uh, but the default at the moment in our system is that the transmission utility that builds it owns it and gets a rate of return on it. Uh, just to follow up on that, does the federal government have a better, uh, I guess, uh, reputation in um, maintaining and upgrading those systems versus the private market? I think it's different. I mean, I think the federal government has, <clears throat> uh, the federal power administrations do a great job. And I think the private market does a great job too. I think the, you know, there are different tools to be used in different times. And in sort of my humble opinion, I think a lot of the federal programs were put in place um, to solve a particular problem. So be it a, a you know a siting problem or a um, <clears throat> eminent domain sort of issue, um, and they're they're useful for that. But uh, but they do a great job too. Okay. Well, this has been.